Lots have just been like out of dreams. Amazing, amazing technologies. Um, so I'm very pleased to bring up to the podium um, Hani Farid, who from if Dartmouth College is going to talk about digital forensics from social media to social impact. to um, start with some sobering statistics. Uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NICMIC, is a DC-based NGO that deals with all aspects of child safety, both in the physical space and in the online space. Uh, they report, uh, last year they received 8 million reports of child pornography uh, just within the US, primarily from law enforcement, private indiv individuals, and tech companies. They also report, in this country alone, 460,000 missing children, uh, 220,000 reports of sexual exploitation of young children, and over the last five years, we've seen a 1,000% increase in sex trafficking alone in this country, and the average age of a child involved in sex trafficking and child pornography is 12 years of age. So these are sobering statistics. They are particularly sobering when you consider that this is only US-based data. We constitute about 5% of the world's population. So imagine these numbers scaled up by a factor of 20 or more, and you get a sense of the harm that is being done to children around the world and here in our own backyard. I'd like to focus a little bit on this number today, this 8 million reports of child pornography. And it's helpful to have a little historical context to understand how we got to such a staggering amount of child pornography being transmitted around the internet. Prior to 1982, uh, this is sort of astonishing, uh, child pornography in this country was legal. Uh, it was protected speech. In 1982, the Supreme Court of the United States banned child pornography because of the harm that it brought to the children involved in the creation of this content. Uh, by 1990, NICMIC, the National Center, reported that child pornography was more or less a solved problem. Uh, it was very hard to find, production um, decreased, um, consumption decreased, and the problem essentially went away. The law worked. Uh, by early 2000, however, with the rise of the internet, uh, we saw a growing increase in the production and distribution of child pornography again. And in 2003, then Attorney General Ashcroft started demanding from tech companies that they do something about this problem because their platforms were the dominant place where child pornography was being distributed and shared. Uh, by 2008, technology companies had done absolutely nothing. Five years had gone by, the problem had continued to escalate, there had been increasing pressure from the Attorney General and from the White House, and we had actually done absolutely nothing to curb this problem online. In 2008, I was invited to, um, by Nick Mick to uh, DC to meet with them and to meet with technology companies to sort of try to figure out why were they incapable or unwilling maybe to do anything about this. And so I went to DC, and uh, in their defense, uh, tech companies were being asked to solve a very hard problem. They were being asked, at internet scale, to be able to take an image, determine is there a person in it? Is that person underage? And here's the hard part. Is the content sexually explicit? Okay, this is in 2008. And um, it was the proverbial needle in a haystack problem because at the time, Facebook was dealing with half a billion uploads a day. Today, that number is upwards of a billion. Um, and the first question I asked as a good engineer was, well, how hard is the problem? I mean, what are we really trying to do? So let's look at some of those numbers. So first of all, we had to be able to process 500 images per second. We had two milliseconds to process an image. And of course, that was to be able to deal with the internet scale of content that is being uploaded and distributed around the, the web on a daily basis. We needed to have a false alarm rate on the order of one in 50 billion. Uh, and that's, of course, because given the sensitive nature of this material, you can't misclassify um, non-child pornography as child pornography because there are consequences to that. At the same time, we wanted to have a 99% accuracy. That is, when we see child pornography in the network, we should detect it with a 99% accuracy to make this effort actually worthwhile. And all along, we had to respect user privacy and be very careful given the sensitive nature of the material because of the legal um, standings of how we uh, manage child pornography. So no doubt an extremely difficult problem. 
at the end of the meeting when I was in DC in 2008, I thought, all right, I understand why nobody's done anything. These are incredibly demand, demanding engineering problems. This is an incredibly hard problem. And computer vision, machine learning is simply not there to solve that problem. And I was ready to, to call it a day and go home and say, well, we're going to have to wait until the technology advances. And so I heard two interesting facts from then CEO Ernie Allen of NCMEC. Fact number one. NCMEC is home to millions of known child pornography. This is content that has been reviewed by uh, law enforcement and uh, people at NCMEC. Um, there is no question of age in the children, and there is no question of sexual exploitation. This is clearly child pornography. Fact number one. Fact number two is that these same images, year in and year out, decade in and decade out, continually get redistributed. Um, we know this because we keep receiving reports of the same content over decades. And so I thought, well, maybe we're trying to solve the wrong problem. Maybe we shouldn't be asking, is this content child pornography? Maybe we should be asking a simpler question. Is this an image that's in NCMEC's database? Because if it's in the database, I know that it's child pornography. There's no question about it. And so I've sidestepped this very, very hard content-based problem, which in 2008 was certainly not possible. And I would argue it's not possible today, even with all the advances um, at, at internet scale. So I'm not going to dive into the technical details of, details of how we did this, but let me give you an overview of how we've approached this problem of determining if we have seen this image before. So here are the demands. I give you an image, the image on the left. And I ask you, I'm going, to, I'm going to be passing billions of images through your system, and I'm going to ask you, have you seen this image before? And when you have a match, as you see on the row one here, you should say yes. And at the same time, for any other image in the universe, which is essentially an infinite set, you should tell me that these two images are not equal. Okay? So if these were the only two demands, tell me if I've seen this image before, tell me if it's distinct from another image, this would be more or less a solved problem. You take your favorite, what's called hard hashing algorithm. So this is MD5, SHA-1. And what you do is you extract from an image a mathematically provably unique fingerprint or signature. It is shared by only the exact same image. And it is distinct from all other possible images. This technology is well understood, both mathematically and both computationally. And you simply sit at the pipe matching these hard hashes. Okay? Problem solved. The problem, of course, is that as images make their way on the internet, they get either intentionally or unintentionally changed. So for example, at Facebook alone, uh, when images are uploaded, they are modified. The metadata is stripped, the images are resized, and they're recompressed, which means that signature that I just described to you that is unique is completely different for the image that you're looking for and the image that is uploaded, even though they actually look like the same image. So the technology that we set out to develop was what we call robust hashing. It was a technology that satisfied row one and row two here, but also satisfied that third row, which is that when I have the same image that has been modified in terms of the color, or maybe somebody's put a border or text on it, or maybe it's been transcoded and the quality is a little bit lower, or maybe the resolution is a little bit lower, we should have that, say, the signature should be respected. And the challenge here was if you only have to find uniqueness, it's actually a relatively easy problem. But now I have to satisfy row one, row two, and row three. And satisfying row two and row three is hard because I have to match against all variants of myself but not confuse myself with any other possible image in an infinite set of possible images. And therein lies the technical challenge. Again, I won't get into the technical details of how we did this, but let me give you an overview of the system. NCMEC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, is home to millions and millions of known child pornography. They provide the content that is known to be uh, CP. We then extract from that a robust hash, which we call photo DNA. That's a unique digital fingerprint that is robust to modifications to images. We then sit at the pipe of a social media, a cloud service, a search engine, and every single image that we see, we extract the same photo DNA signature, that robust hash. We compare it against the database. And if it's a hit, you uh, filter the image out. You make a report to NCMEC, uh, and you extract the, the images from the, the, the service. Um, I will say that we met the engineering demands. We, uh, we are able to process uh, each image in two milliseconds. Uh, we have a false alarm rate less than one in 50 billion. It's actually closer to one in 100 billion. Um, we have a 99% detection accuracy, and we have shown that it would be exceedingly difficult to reverse engineer the signature to create the image from it, which is important in the legal setting. 
We developed this technology between 2008 and 2009, and in 2009 it was deployed on Microsoft's uh, then cloud service SkyDrive and on their search engine. In 2010, Facebook deployed this uh, technology on their entire network worldwide. 2011, Twitter, and 2016, Google uh, tripped over the finish line and finally deployed the technology. To give you a sense of the efficacy, uh, last year alone, in just one year, we removed 10 million known child pornography content from around the world. Uh, that's only searching, by the way, for 30,000 images in the current database. That database should be closer to 30 million. So multiply these by three orders of magnitude and you are starting to get a sense of the scale of the distribution and consumption of child pornography worldwide. Keeping in mind, by the way, that the average age of children involved that is 12 years down to infants. Uh, of course, child pornography is not the only hateful and harmful speech online. There are many things that we are seeing over the last few years that are very troubling to civilized society. Uh, over the last few years, I've started to think about how technology like photo DNA and the child exploitation space can be used in other spaces, and in particular, counter-extremism. Um, our leaders have been telling us that the internet has been a boom for extremist group. President Obama last year said, the high quality of videos, the online magazines, the use of social media, terrorist accounts, uh, it's all designed to target young people online in cyberspace. The radicalization of extremists is happening online, not on the ground anymore. Prime Minister May just the other day said after the London attacks, the fight against terrorism and hate speech has to be a joint one. The government and security services are doing everything they can, and it is clear that social media can and must do more. Over the last two years, I've been working with the White House, the EU, the United Nations to develop the next generation of photo DNA technology in the fight of online extremism. In particular, we've been working with an N a New York-based NGO, the Counter Extremism Project, uh, to develop eGlyph, which extends the photo DNA technology to video and audio, which has itself its own significant challenges in, in, in managing that massive amount of data. YouTube alone has 300 hours of uploads every minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You're dealing with a massive amount of data, and we have to think very hard about how to manage that. Uh, lastly, I will say it is extremely important to understand that the technology that we have developed and deployed can be misused. The technology is agnostic as to what it looks for, and it can be used in ways that we disagree with. And so we have to be exceedingly cautious in how we deploy it. I will say that as we have deployed photo DNA and most recently eGlyph, we have been exceedingly cautious in how we license it. We have very strict guidelines on what it can be used for and what it cannot be used for. The goal of this technology is not to impinge on an open and free internet. It is not to stifle debate. It is to remove the most hateful and harmful content and to mitigate some of the effects of some of the worst things that we are seeing online. It is our hope that this technology, deployed in a thoughtful way with the right policies and the right laws, can be more effective in making the internet a safer place. Thank you very much. I just had a question on copyright infringement. Has uh, Facebook and Google and the Microsoft of the world been, been concerned that this uh, photo DNA could be used against them to force them to check for copyright infringement? I know that stock photography companies are using bots yes. to compare photography. Yes. Um, it's a great question, and the answer is yes, they were concerned, but the way we license the technology is the license says you can only use this for child exploitation. So even if companies or governments lean on the companies to do more, they will say, look, our hands are tied. They are tied by licensing agreements, and we did that very intentionally so that this would not have mission creep. I will say, however, that uh, YouTube and Google do a very good job of copyright infringement um, takedown on their own because they're getting sued. Um, nobody was suing them because they had child pornography on their network. And so you see a very different approach to these technologies. Um, you've seen just over the last week, uh, Google has been under intense pressure because advertisers have been fleeing their networks because they are advertising on extremist-related material. And suddenly they are waking up to the fact that they can't turn a blind eye to the hateful and harmful things happening on their networks. And I think we're going to start to see that. But you're right, you have to think about how to deploy this in a careful and thoughtful way so there is not mission creep. And that is something we are very concerned about and we're very aware of. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much.